Hello, and welcome to the 10th episode of What Sex Got to Do With It. And I'm here with my uh, favorite <laughs> author in all of North America, you know, <laughs> Heather Remoff, you know, and, and you know, uh, chapter nine is called Rewrite the Script, you know, and the genesis of that. And the genesis of that is... I do believe that we're evolved animals and that we have species-specific behavior that's part and parcel of who we are as humans. And I also believe that not all of it serves us well. And so the question is, can we rise above some of the species-specific traits that I think are not serving us well? And that's what I would call rewriting the script. I think Mother Nature slash evolution has written the script for us, has, I, I think I mentioned in that chapter, uh, we, this song and dance routine that we go through in terms of courtship, um, the choreographer may be casting us in, in roles based just on whether we're male or female, and we may not necessarily want to perform in, in the way that our XY chromosomes would have us do, but can we rise above some of what's programmed in, into our, our species-specific behavior evolutionarily, and, you know, shaped behavior? Can we rise above it? I think we can. I got that idea from one of my mentors at, um, at Rutgers, uh, Robin Fox, and he used to quote the scene in uh, African Queen where the Catherine Hepburn character says to the uh, or the Humphrey Bogart character says to the Catherine Hepburn character, um, it's only human nature, is how he explains some right. behavior that she found offensive. And she draws herself up and says, human nature is what we're here to rise above. And and I think we do have to rise, learn to rise above some of the the aspects of our human nature that I don't think are serving us well. And the question is, can we do it? Can we rewrite the script? Gotcha. Interesting. You know, uh, so so I guess what we're getting at here is, are there individuals the that have variants in their behavior that is different from the average human behavior, and whether or not you know there are people who are attracted to each other with those variants, and those variants then become the dominant um, population, they, they dominate the population. Is that what we're getting at? Um, uh, partly, but it, just for any individual, I think we're all so different. Yeah. And even though you mentioned like the genetic yeah. differences between us are tiny, you mentioned in a previous episode, yeah. and that of course is true. But some tiny differences can have huge expressions, right. uh, you know, huge differences in outcome. Right. But I'm really thinking like stereotypically male and female behavior. Yeah. And can, like, for example, women are programmed, shaped by evolution, as I've said in I, one of my chapters. The human brain has been shaped by evolution to be really good at two things, reproduction and survival. But what about if an individual woman decides she doesn't want to have children? Can she, can she, in a sense, rise above that biological dictate? and decide, you know, that's not a game I'm playing. Now you can, and we can discuss whether that may be genetic programming that makes her f able to rise above it or not, but... Uh, what know, else would it, it be? Could, well, it could be culturally. Uh, but her response to the cultural is genetic, right? I, yes, yeah. I, I, I do think that's true. I, I would agree with you on that. So that's but, why but, I said the variance. Yeah, in, yeah, in the, the variance. The but, the, but, you know, we're, we're all different, and, you know, we have cultural expectations, and can we change that? Can we change, can, you know, one of the underlying assumptions about males and females, and that has a good genetic explanation, is what's um, the sort of shorthand version of as... as um, Eggs are, or sperm is cheap, eggs are expensive, and that, that that underlying premise explains the difference between male and female 
courtship behavior, sexual behavior, that women are much more selective, men less so. Uh, can we change that? You know, can, do we have to abide? As, 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 and certainly, I think today's young people um, have a very different approach to sexual behavior than certainly my generation did. But I'm not sure that they're su successfully rising above the biological dictates in that I, you know, for example, the, the hookup culture, um, that isn't when women are less concerned about being very selective about their partners, you know, when that falls by the wayside, in a sense that would be challenging um, our biological dictates. And I'm not sure that the hookup culture happens well for women. And, right. and, and so that's the kind of thing I'm talking about. Can we, can we these basic biological dictates, um, cheap sperm, expensive egg kind of thing, can we behave in ways that violate that? And I absolutely think that we can, and I think we do. But I think we have to be mindful of our own happiness and be aware of the ways in which our our brains trick us into behaving in ways that are in opposition to what we say we want. And what is it that we want? Oh, of course, it depends. I, I think, I think most women, um, from a relationship, I'm now here talking about male-female differences. I think most women really want to be in a more committed relationship. Mm -hmm than the hookup culture would indicate. In oh. other words, I think their behavior is at odds with what they're biologically programmed to feel, which is to look for connection f in a way that would help the survival of any children mm -hmm. they happen to have. I, I think the hookup culture isn't necessarily thinking, uh, you know, aiming for, you know, mm -hmm. not aiming to have children, aiming to not have children right. in most cases. But I think, I, 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 I am concerned a little bit. I think I mentioned at the end of that chapter that uh, I'm concerned that the hookup culture is mostly fired by heavy drinking. And if it takes large amounts of alcohol to help women get over their tendency to be selective and to be okay with hookup sex, then I'm not so sure that's a healthy thing. And if it takes large amounts of alcohol for men to get over their fear of rejection, because I think that is is much as, you know, I think men need to be encouraged a little bit to know that they're not going to be rejected by women. Then I'm a little concerned. You know, I don't, I don't think that that's necessarily good for the happiness of the individual actors. I hear you. I hear you. you know, uh, so, so, um, yeah, um, uh, yeah, and I'm resisting the urge to to pursue that more. Not because it's not worthy of pursuit, but once again, as with chapter eight, you know, this one just has so much um, potential in it. You know, and one is uh, where you, um, I think it's your statement. You say that um, biology is not destiny; it's statistical probability. Yeah, I'm quoting my other men mentor. My two mentors at Rutgers were Robin Fox and Lionel Tiger, and that's Lionel's line. Okay. Uh, biology is not destiny, it's statistical probability. And I love that line because it means you cannot look at an individual man or an individual woman or individual anything, and just by looking at them or focusing on one, one thing, you can predict very much else about them. Right. But, yeah. but if you always bet that women would be more selective than men. If every time you saw a woman, you would bet that she's a little more selective than the men in her life in terms of meeting them. If, if you played that out over time, you'd end up making money if you, if, may, if you bet on it every time. But you can't predict for the individual woman or the individual man or the individual anything. I mean, you know, and again, that goes to our very artificial construct, which is race. That's a social construct. Right. It doesn't, as far as I'm concerned, doesn't have a biological. And yet, if there are things we can identify, skin color, for example, is an easy one. To look at someone based on that and assume you can predict anything about them is just completely ridiculous.
you know, <laughs> that one. It's not even statistical probability. Right. But, um, you know, but so you, you but in ter mostly I was talking about male and female there. You cannot, and, and again, gender comes in all, you know, there's a, there's a, a, a continuum. And someone is very cisgendered female on one end and um, very male on the other end. But then there's a whole range of behaviors in between and, and identities. And you just can't look at someone and predict. But overall, you know, in terms of male and female and reproductive behavior, I think female reproductive behavior and male reproductive behavior in terms of how they evolved are, are different based on, once we have sexual selection, that's a specialized, now we have a specialized division of labor. That's a specialized division of labor. And, 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 and so we're gonna be doing things differently. Right. Because that, that creates an efficiency. Sexual selection is really good because it enables the shuffling of genes. Asexual uh, reproduction is... It's is, more cloning. Yes, yeah, like cloning. Right. You, you don't have the genetic variability the and no. responsiveness. Right. So sexual selection, or, or, or sexual reproduction rather, is, 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 is very good in terms of an evolutionary... Uh, system in that you can evolve much more quickly with, well, it with, gives you more variation with, with sexual reproduction because it gives you more variation right. and that results in this original division of labor between men and women there right. we've specialized we each bring something different to it and right. and it's the difference between the sexes yeah. it's the origin of the so-called yeah. war between the sexes right. and the fun between the sexes right. let's 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 oh. be clear on that but i think we never can pretend that men and women approach sex and courtship entirely the same. Yeah. There may be some men who do, and some, you know, some men and women may approach very much the same. But in, again, in terms of the statistical probability right. thing, right. And men and women, because it's, it's, it's a division of labor, right. a specialized yeah. division of labor, and so. But it isn't so much that biology isn't destiny as much as it is that you can't predict that's from right. It, you yeah. know, because because I think we those those two clauses seemingly are in contrast to each other, but they really aren't because because the destiny is there. It's just that you can't you can't pre predict. predict you, know. you can't predict based on on a single trait. Whether, for example, whether someone is genetically female or genetically male, you can't predict based on that single factor. Right. So so that's and yet right. it's it's uh, right. So that that's what that's what the so early on, I mean, if, uh, not early on, but at the beginning of this paragraph, uh, it starts with, when the pill enabled humans to divorce sex from reproduction, we had the hubris to assume we'd likewise divorce sex from its evolutionary history. Feminists of all sexes became science deniers. Mm -hmm. So this notion of science deniers, I, mean, um, I, I, I found that it was kind of prevalent when dealing with the vaccine. I mean, for okay. COVID, and, and also before COVID, it used to be yeah. that vaccine deniers, I mean, were not, I mean, um, radical rightists. I mean, they were the, uh, the on the left, I mean, uh -huh. uh, for the most part. And, and for me, it wasn't that they were science deniers. It was that they were doing the science wrong. Okay. They, because they, they would base their whole premise in like, well, it would be like a scientific logic, I mean, to what they were the rationale they were using to get to the conclusion. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, my feelings were that you shouldn't approach these people as if they don't believe in science. You just try to understand I mean, where their logic goes wrong uh -huh. and, and then try to reorient them there. So that's my take on, on the, the feminists. You see where well, I'm getting at? Well, yes, I, and, and actually, I, and when I was writing that, I was recalling in the 60s and the 70s um, you know, I was at Rutgers uh, working on my PhD in the mid '70s, and I remember the early feminists and and Ms. Magazine, and the the assumption was that there were no differences between men and women. Yeah. And my reaction at that time, if that's the foundation on which you're building your feminism, that there are no differences between men and women, your foundation you're building it on sand. Right. Because that is not 
that's not a solid base right. on which to build feminism. You cannot start with the assumption that there are no differences between men and women. There are a lot of differences between men and women. How much we allow them to impact things. There are biological differences for right. biological. Again, it's, it's, it's the sexual reproduction. The, right. And, and so that was my reaction, you know, to yeah. early feminism. Yeah. Oh, you can't pretend if you. And I was a feminist. I've right. always thought I am a feminist. Yeah, right, 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 I've right. always thought yeah. of my, myself as a feminist. I get furious, furious when women get denied opportunities and right. are ignored and aren't given, aren't aren't seen as as smart or as clever. Those things enrage me. Right. But to assume that there's no difference between men and women is is. Um, I think it gets us in trouble. Right, right. But they're not denying science, though, right? Well, if you're saying men and women are the same, that's a bit of science denying. I, mean, I guess my point is that they're just doing science wrong. Mm. And so you, just, you see the distinction I'm making? That they, it, that they, I mean, so, so, so I think they have some scientific basis for their conclusion, but they're just coming to the wrong conclusion. Would well, you say that they are not, or they're saying, would they, would they be people who, I guess maybe we're just a semantic. This is semantic. I mean, so so you're saying almost by definition, when you come to the wrong conclusion, you're a science denier. No, no. I, uh. When you start with the wrong facts, I think. Oh. And, but, you, but, and you're basing your conclusion on facts that you wish were true, rather than facts that you've examined thoughtfully. Okay. Well, I see your point. But yeah. Still. And 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 the early feminists, that was a fact they wished was true, that men and women were the same. Well, and that and the early feminists. I'm not talking yeah. about now. Of course, it's a whole yeah. range. But yeah. you know, again, yeah. you can't you can't say oh, I'm a feminist and then know yeah. very much about what someone's philosophical stance on many things really is, yeah. except to know that they're a champion of women and think women's yeah. rights are right. important. Right. But um, I, again, in the early days when the declaration in my generation of the early, right. you know, back in the '60s, was that men and women are the same. And, and that it's, we've imposed cultural differences on them. Yeah. And I just thought, if that's the basis on which you're building your feminism, it's, not, it's on a very weak foundation. Yeah. Well, I still, I, I guess even though if you're saying that the, the facts are wrong and that makes it not science, I guess the, what I, pushing my argument more, is just that you can still get to the wrong facts using science. I mean, you just have the wrong conclusion. I mean, um, and so, so I think what I mean, they were saying is that I mean, there is no genetic reason, I mean, um, other than the sex chromosomes, I mean, for for thinking that men and women are different. I mean, uh, and and so I think that's where they were starting from. I mean, uh, and then yeah, I, um, I think where they were starting from was that those biological differences. Right don't result in behavioral differences. That, that it's wrong to assume they're behavioral differences that spring from those biological differences. Uh -huh. And, and um, that's a hard one to prove. Yeah. Uh, you know, of course, again, yeah. biology is not right. destiny, it's statistical probability. Right. Right. But I remember, you know, going to conferences in the early days of sociobiology and you'd, you'd hear, um, Researchers get up, women who would say, "Oh, until I believe I had children, I believed that that you know you could just raise child children to embrace any gender." And then they found out that wasn't necessarily right. true; yeah. that it right. was very difficult. Right. To, but it doesn't apply to all children again, right. because probably because there's some biological, uh, there's a range of biological differences between children. Right. Gotcha. So this is more of a style thing, you know, uh, and, and, and so we, I know we can say anything on cable, but I'm not. No, don't. Uh, uh, <laughs> and, 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 and so, but when you're talking about Aziz and Zari. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. Now and, that, yeah, that's an X-rated uh, section yeah. in terms of the language. Yeah. yeah, and so I was just wondering, why did you use the F word when you could have used a different word? Well, because that was... The comedian Samantha B. Yeah. That was the charge she leveled at Aziz Ansari. Okay. If you call yourself a feminist, then f like a feminist. 
Right. So okay. And that that was that's why I'm using that word because I was react, reacting to, to her to her, to her charge. Gotcha. And, um, gotcha. That makes sense. Yeah. yeah so yeah, so that's, that's right. why that's that's in there. Gotcha. I orig I originally wrote that section hoping to pitch it to a magazine. Uh huh. And. Uh, and just let myself go with that one. But yeah, that's what, but I was very curious um, when I read the transcript that described the, the so-called, uh, our, our viewers may not even remember this episode, but a woman, young woman named Anonymous Grace who complained on a, on a website, uh, oh, I'm forgetting the, the, the name of the website, of, about the behavior of this famous comedian that she'd had right. to date with. Right. And and it caused quite a stir at the time. And I looked back over their behavior and kind of just traced it through, did some Monday morning quarterbacking and just traced it through, looked at it as if I were interviewing them and watching them. You know, it was the, the anthropologist who's interested in courtship behavior, looking at where the behavior went off the rails. Right, gotcha. And, uh, yeah. but, but yeah, it was Samantha yeah, Bee's gotcha. charge at, uh, yeah. Gotcha, gotcha. You know, I like Samantha Bee. Me, I like her way of her. Her, her humor's funny. I like her her <laughs> general uh, approach. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, and yeah, and, and you had talked about this a little earlier in. Cause it was later in the chapter where you talk about um, um, the Humphrey Bogart character and Charlie Allnut and uh, and Rose. I mean, and and she says that she we were put in this world to rise above nature, and. This is kind of stuff referential. I mean, kind of hinted at this before, but um, isn't rising above nature part of nature? Well, for humans, it is. Yeah. In that our culture is very much an expression of of our biology. You know, the cult. I, in fact, I. Again, you have to help me out here, but if you look at cultural things like the Ten yeah. Commandments. Yeah. All the things that they tell you not to do, why do we have to be told not to do them other than the fact that in our biology right. there's a tendency to do them? So those commandments, in a sense, are an attempt to rise above our human nature. Thou shalt not kill. Um, yet look at us as a species. What is it that we do so extremely well? We really are a pretty murderous species. Species were very given to war, et cetera, et cetera. So I look at those kinds of commandments almost as, a, as an indication of what our, our base nature is. Uh -huh. And those are the ways in which we're rising, trying to rise above it. And again, if you turn on the news, it doesn't look as if we're being very successful. I hear you, I hear you, okay. You know, because uh, I guess the part, the, I, this is coming from a, a, f a sense that I have when people separate us humans from nature. Oh, I, I, I understand where you are in that. And, I'm and, completely, we are not separate from nature. We are, and we are very, 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 we're evolved animals, just yeah. like every other species on right. this planet yeah. is. And we are very much connected to nature. Unfortunately, we try to separate ourselves from nature. Right. And, and um, I think we get into a little bit of trouble when we do that too much, but there are aspects of us. As, as you, you know, um, my daughter has told me I'm not allowed to say the word species because I despair sometimes at what humans are doing. And right. I, I often will say to my daughter, oh, we're not a pretty species. Yeah. And, and I, I am afraid I mean, I love being human. I am human. I love many of the things we do, but I'm deeply, deeply troubled about many of the things we as a species are doing. And we have to learn how to correct those things that are causing so much damage, right. uh, both to the environment and to each other. Yeah, we're going to be getting to that. Yeah, yeah, we're, yeah. We're, we're headed in that direction mm -hmm. in, in, in Chapter 10. But this one chapter, I mean, ends me with some. Um, well, I think it ends with this line. It certainly is the last paragraph that I cut out for um, um, review. Unless and until we learn to decipher the messages we are sending each other, neither men nor women are likely to have experiences that lead to the emotionally satisfying relationships that both claim to want. So what percentage of the population you think is capable of deciphering the messages? Because we're not of complete failures. Species. Oh no! We're, oh no! Yeah. <laughs> well, well, most people consider us the most successful species ever. Uh -huh. um, 
but we've changed our environment so much that we're no longer well adapted to so, it. So yeah. then what percentage is capable or, or is it? The, uh, is, uh, repeat your question. So, so yeah, so, so you're saying that we need to be able uh, to have, ex well, let me see, we need to go back and reread. Unless and until we've learned to decipher the messages that we're sending to each other, that's mm -hmm. your quote, you yeah. know. Uh, we need the men and women are likely to have experiences that lead to the emotionally satisfying relationships that we both claim to want. I mean, so essentially saying we're, we are either losing or have lost the ability to decipher messages. No, you know? I, well, I think, and I say in this chapter, yeah. that because the directive, the evolutionary directive, right. is to reproduce, we've right. been designed, our brain has been designed to drive us to do that. Right. And that women, the message, women are to be more selective than men, again, because of the cheap sperm, expensive right. egg. Uh, equation there, but women are not always going to find their absolute dream partner. Right. And so women are very good in the early stages of courtship right. at kidding themselves. I say the, the directive to women appears to be when you can find the perfect man and when you can't invent him. And where women get in trouble is when we start inventing men in the early stages of a relationship. And I just think for women to be aware of that, right. it, it, it helps us avoid some heartbreak. Right. Oh, is he really, is he, you know, is he really everything that I'm telling my friends he is? Right. Or is it just that I need to believe that he is? And again, she may not even be someone who wants children, right. but there is that biological directive there to right. reproduce. And this was in the context of the young women, you know, um, and men getting drunk in order to have yeah, yeah. Pain. And so do you think that's really just a, fa a function of age and maturity? Or do you think well, the I, species are really changing? That, that well, I don't are, think the species has changed. I think... Well, do you think that women in, in, in young men in, are different you know, in the 80s? I mean, different now than they were in the, let's say, the 80s and the, maybe the... Because it's probably a function of the digital technology? I, some of it yeah. is that, and, and, and again, males do pretty much still control most things. And I don't think that by d imitating the worst traits of men, women then become liberated. Yeah. And I think that whole hookup culture is a matter of women imitating the worst traits of men. Most men are, are not just promiscuous lectures right. just looking to get laid. I don't right. believe that at all. It's going to bring us to designing women in okay. our next chapter, and we're wrapping this up okay. a few seconds we'll late. Okay, we'll end on that. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <That's all. laughs> we'll end on that.